Hello and Happy New Year! This is Ozpol Explained, I'm your curly haired host as always, David, and I'm here to explain to you everything to do with Australian politics, specifically Federation. January 1st is more than just a New Year's Day and an opportunity to sleep in, it's also the date of Federation, an incredibly important date in Australian history. But what was Federation and how did it happen? Well, I hope your New Year's resolution is to learn more about Australian political history because that's what we're going to be doing right now. Firstly, what was Federation? January 1st, 1901 was the day that Australia became a country. The constitution came into effect, the Commonwealth of Australia was formed, and the federal government was created. This allowed us to collectively govern in our own right. Before this, while the continent was known as Australia, it wasn't a nation, but six separate British colonies that are now known as the Six States taking place on the lands of hundreds of different indigenous peoples. So it wasn't the state of Western Australia, it was the colony of Western Australia. But what were the reasons for federation? Well, having separate colonies meant that they had to all compete with each other and there was poor coordination with issues of common interest. The argument was that a federal government would be able to create uniform and organized decisions for things that affected the entire country. For example, the military. The colonies had their own defense forces, but these were partially volunteer militias that were disorganized and lacked equipment and training. The British Navy would have to patrol the Australian coast just to make sure it was safe from other nations. And it was recommended that a federal government would be better at organizing and resourcing a consistent military. Free trade was a big issue, a very central one. If you wanted to send goods from, say, South Australia to Queensland, there was a thing called a tariff, which is a kind of tax for imports and exports, which nowadays is for goods from other countries, not Farmer Kevin's beetroots from down the road. This was a useful way for the colonies to make money, but it made buying and selling goods harder because they were more expensive. Federation would remove these tariffs, which was both a pro and a con depending on how you look at it. Some people were like, ah, this sucks, tariffs make things cost more money. And others were like, ah, this is great, tariffs mean I can make more money. Economics. Immigration was also a motivating factor, as many people in Australia had a strong anti-Chinese sentiment and didn't want a multicultural society. Creating a national government would create a more effective and uniform immigration policy. There was also a growing national pride and identity. By 1888, 70% of Australia's population was born on the continent, and so people were beginning to identify as Australian rather than British. So, the road to federation, how did we get here? The idea of a united Australia had been an idea around for several decades, but it wasn't until the 1880s that the movement really got going. The colonies tried to work together to coordinate matters of common interest. Victoria, Tasmania, Queensland, Western Australia and Fiji sent a petition to the British Parliament to create the Federal Council of Australasia. It was formed in 1885 thanks to an act of British Parliament, and as you can tell by the name, it wasn't limited to just Australia. Any colony in the Australasian region could send representatives and join or leave whenever they felt like it. The colonies were like, hey, we're neighbours, we might as well try to get along and work together. And then Victoria and New South Wales sent, no we don't, and then wouldn't show up at the same meetings together because they were going through a rough patch in their relationship. Which is totally fine now. Wink. The council was like a proto-federal government, and like many first drafts, didn't really work as had hoped. 
It was limited in that it didn't have any executive power or revenue of its own. It met to discuss matters of common interest, but couldn't enforce its decisions beyond the power of the individual colonies. It's also hard to create a uniform decision for an entire continent if a large part of that doesn't attend half the meetings or at all. South Australia briefly was part of it between 1888 and 1890. New South Wales and New Zealand never joined. The Federal Council of Australasia had some limited legislative powers over things like relationships with Pacific Islands, fisheries beyond territorial limits, the influx of criminals, enforcements of court judgments and criminal processes beyond colonial boundaries, other matters such as defence, quarantine, patents, weights and measures, recognition of marriage and divorce beyond colonial boundaries. Spoilers. All these things become elements of the Australian Constitution and responsibilities of the federal government. The thing that they were trying to emulate. Though for all you Section 51 fans, or 51ers as we're known, you already knew that. <laughs> Nerds. The idea was there. It just needed work. So it's time to bring in one of our central characters, Sir Henry Parks, also known as the Father of Federation. Parks was the Premier of New South Wales, who is remembered for his dedication, organisation and campaigning to make Federation happen. June of 1889, Henry Parks had a conversation with the New South Wales Governor, Lord Carrington, where he boasted he could federate the colonies in only 12 months. Carrington then said, Oh yeah? I dare you to prove it bro. Double dare you. But, you know, in whatever way that they speak in 19th century aristocratic talk. You know. Parks, like many creatives with an ambitious project, really underestimated how long it would take. As is the way to make political change happen, he decided to engage directly with the public. With the Tenterfield Oration. In 1889, Henry Parks, former member for the district of Tenterfield, gave a speech in Tenterfield, New South Wales at the Tenterfield School of Arts. This famous speech is, you'll never guess why, called the Tenterfield Oration. Three guesses. While the idea of federation had been discussed by politicians for a while now, this is considered the first direct appeal to the public on the issue. Parks argued that federation was vital for national defence and would remove interstate tariffs, an issue that was very important to the people of Tenterfield because it was right next to the border of Queensland. The speech was widely reported in Sydney. Lord Carrington, in his upper-class British accent, spoke thusly. Whoa, dude, that speech was gnarly as. You need to come back to Sydney and give us the remix ASAP. Or something like that. Parks agreed and went on a tour where he gave 15 performances of the speech. People loved it and wanted to know when the album was dropping. The album being the constitution that would make all of this possible. Problem was, it hadn't been written yet. This leads us to the conferences and conventions where the constitution was written. Part 1. 1891. A conference in Sydney was held where representatives from the six colonies and also New Zealand, met. Fiji was invited but didn't come because it was really far to travel, which made them stop and think, be like, hey, wait, this doesn't actually make much sense. Why would we want to be part of Australia? They're so far away. And while they were considering that, we spent the next five weeks writing the constitution. The Queensland Premier, Sir Samuel Griffith, is largely credited with drafting the constitution, but he was helped by some other people, including the South Australian Premier, Charles Kingston, Edmund Barton, and Andrew Inglis Clark. The key features of the draft constitution included some familiar things, like the composition of the federal parliament, which is the monarch represented by the governor general, the senate, and the house of representatives. As well as the responsibilities of that federal government, the house of representatives were to be elected based off population, there would be equal representation for the states in the senate, and it would establish the high court. It also mentions the division of powers between the parliament, which has the power to make the law, the executive to implement the law, and the courts to then interpret the law. 
And as every writer knows, just when you think you're going to finish, a distraction happens and gets in the way. Australia was hit with a pretty big distraction, a depression. As in an economic one, and progress stalled for a while. Federation? In this economy? But never fear, as is the way with important historical political change, it's the people that make it happen. A people's conference was formed in the New South Wales town of Carrawa in 1893, and another in Bathurst in 1896, calling for a new convention to work on the draft of the constitution and get it done. So take two, the 1897-98 to Federation Convention. Elected and appointed representatives from the colonies, except for Queensland, met between 1897 and 1898, first in Adelaide, then in Sydney, and finally Melbourne, so everyone could get a little bit of tourist sightseeing done in between lengthy discussions about politics, though the Sydney Harbour Bridge wouldn't exist for another 34 years at that point, and the Opera House for another 75, so everyone just got postcards of water to send home. Fiji and New Zealand at this point had decided that this wasn't for them. They'd never really been super enthusiastic to begin with, and again, being super far away made the idea difficult. Fiji and New Zealand, if anything, were more likely to federate together into one country. Though, spoilers, they didn't do that either. We weren't convinced that New Zealand was breaking up with us, so in the constitution we wrote in their name at the start of the list of proposed states, just in case they wanted to come back and join us in the future. We showed them this and they left us on red. The key writers of the updated constitution were Edmund Barton, Richard O'Connor, and Sir John Downer. As is the way with draft revision, a few changes were made along the way. For example, the 1891 constitution would have had senators appointed by the state parliaments instead of elected. Other updates include setting the number of members of the House of Representatives as roughly twice the number of senators, and the possibility of a double dissolution to resolve deadlocks. March 1898, they were done, and now comes the time that every writer dreads getting someone else to read it over and tell you if it's any good. The public would go to vote in a series of referendums between 1898 and 1900. A referendum is where the public votes on a constitutional change, which usually is changing a specific part of it, a section or some wording of it, but in this case it was about all of it all at once. The idea was pretty new in the 19th century. In fact, Australia was the first nation to take a proposed constitution to a referendum. It was Charles Kingston who proposed the idea that if the constitution were to unite Australia as a country, it would be the public who voted on whether or not that was a good idea. Those who campaigned for the yes vote were known as Billites for their support of the Commonwealth Constitutional Bill, and those who were against were known as anti-Billites, because what else are you going to call them? Names are hard, okay? And those in New Zealand and Fiji were called no longer participating, and said stop leaving us sad voicemail messages saying that you miss us, we're not going to join with you. Tasmania, South Australia, and Victoria all voted yes for federation in 1898. New South Wales results also mostly came back yes, but they had a law requiring a minimum of 80,000 people to vote yes for it to count. This is because 80,000 was approximately half of the registered voters, so even though more than half of people who voted said yes, not enough people had voted for it to count. So the premiers had a secret conference to be like, okay, how do we make a few amendments to get the support of New South Wales and also Queensland, which at this point hadn't voted? As every creative person knows, whenever you label something as like the final version, you are doomed to have to update that with final version 2 and so forth. A few changes were made to make those colonies happy, including establishing Australia's national capital within New South Wales, at least 160 kilometres from Sydney which would eventually become Canberra 
and the ACT. So once again in 1899 referendums were held with the updated constitution. New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria all said yes. New South Wales got rid of the whole minimum of 80,000 yes votes rule but that didn't matter because more than 100,000 people voted yes. But wait, what about Western Australia? Well by 1900 they still hadn't voted. The constitution was done though, like it wasn't going to be amended or updated. They clicked save as and labelled it final version 2 for real this time, but Western Australia's government was hesitant to federate because it was concerned it might have a negative impact on its economy. If tariffs were removed that would mean that there would be more competition for goods from the east and maybe not be the best for local industry. Perth was also like really far away from like the rest of the Australian capitals and there wasn't a railway to connect them so Western Australia was considering doing a New Zealand. Still Premier John Forrest took part in the constitutional conventions just in case so if they did join their interests had been voiced and looked after. You know maybe they will, maybe they won't, who knows. Meanwhile in the goldfields they were like oh we know we know we are going to do it if WA won't join Federation we're gonna leave WA and do it on our own. Delegates from several goldfield towns from Boulder and Kalgoorlie all the way down to Esperance met in Coolgardie in December of 1899. They created the Reform League and a petition calling for the colony of Aurelia to be carved out of the southeast of Western Australia. The petition got tens of thousands of signatures and when unrolled was 2.2 kilometers long. They weren't alone, Albany on the southern coast also wanted to carve out a chunk of Western Australia so it could join Federation. Both of these movements resulted in a map with the new proposed boundaries of the colonies as well as printing their petitions for formal presentation. But neither were given to Queen Victoria by the governor of Western Australia. While this was all playing out the other colonies decided that it was good enough for them. Federation was going to happen with or without Western Australia. Now because these are all British colonies they were still dependent on the British Parliament. So in March of 1900 a delegation went to London to go to the British Parliament and be like hello please pass our constitutional bill, we're real adults now, please. 5th of July 1900, the British Parliament agreed to pass the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act. Four days later Queen Victoria signs it. Royal assent has been given, the constitution will come into effect January 1st 1901. It is official. Western Australia still has not voted yet. Oh Oh no! The constitution, if you've never read it, talks about how New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland and Tasmania have all agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal commonwealth. And then a few paragraphs down it goes, oh and also if Her Majesty is satisfied the people of Western Australia can also agree to join it and be included which is like the constitutional equivalent of holding open the door for someone even though they're like awkwardly really too far away. But I'm glad they did it. 31st of July 1900 Western Australia holds a vote over three weeks after the constitution has already been signed. Thankfully a vast majority of people vote yes for federation just in time. January 1st 1901 Federation happens, a new year, a new country, the Commonwealth of Australia is proclaimed in Centennial Park in Sydney, up to half a million people line the way to the Federation Parade. There were fireworks displays, pageants, sporting events and celebratory dinners all around Australia. In Sydney celebrations lasted a week. Edmund Barton, remember him, became the first Prime Minister of Australia. This is a fantastic time for many who campaigned for it, but unfortunately Henry Parks would not live to see this happen. He had died in 1896, just five years short of the creation of the Commonwealth of Australia. 
But while we call him the father of Federation, the story of Australia was never just about, you know, Parks and Barton and Griffith and all these figures and people I've talked about. The idea of Federation happened because the public rallied behind the idea. Many leagues, clubs, societies were formed to campaign for Federation. Many women called for Federation as they saw it as a way to give women the right to vote. In 1902, the federal government made it legal for women to vote in federal elections, at a point where only two states, South Australia and Western Australia, had given women the right to vote. Shortly after that, all the other states followed, with Victoria being the last in 1908. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have been living on this land for around 60,000 years. They were not consulted or asked how this new form of government would affect them, and they would be excluded for decades, with Queensland being the last Australian state to give Indigenous people the right to vote in 1965. Then, in 1977, a referendum was held to change the constitution to allow people who lived in territories to be able to vote in referendums. Meaning before then, people who lived in like the ACT in the Northern Territory didn't have a say on proposed constitutional change. Federation was a significant moment that shaped the lives of millions, but the future is still unwritten. The great advantage that we have today, compared to the 1890s, is that we as a community, regardless of race or gender, will decide the future of Australia together. And there you have it. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a happy new year. I hope you've enjoyed this as I've enjoyed the past few years being able to help people understand better the history and politics of Australia. So if this has been useful to you at any point in time, please do share, subscribe, comment down below what you would like to learn about next, and thank you so much to my supporters on Patreon. I appreciate you all. Thank you everyone, and I will see you next time.